we agreed that uh, we might be facing at least a challenging period for uh, dollar hegemony, um, the question is where might challenges come from? And the really big ones are obviously in the core. This is the story, I think, of 2008 through 2012, that central uh, transatlantic axis. But really tricky ones uh, might be somewhere else, namely on the, on the periphery, what is euphemistically and politely called emerging markets. Now, emerging markets is a, an economic category, but if we were in the world of IR or in the world of leftist uh, international political economy, we'd be talking about the shatter zones of inter-imperial rivalry, uh, the fragile uh, states of the periphery, um, the ground left uh, vacant in the wake of the Cold War. And from an economic point of view, institutions like the BIS and the IIF have been tracking uh, the financial state of those zones in precisely the way that Ian and Sylvia were asking us to track them this morning. In other words, looking at their balance sheets, looking at the currency denomination of their balance sheets, looking at who owns what to foreigners in those places. And the IF, IIF in the summer of 15, which is one of the moments when this anxiety really began to bubble up, produced this entirely characteristic description of that of that zone. And what it's trying to capture is the rapidly increasing exposure of corporate borrowers in the emerging countries to um, dollar-denominated debt, which exposes them to risks in case of exchange rate shocks. We could end up here with a classic one or other version of a uh, sudden stop scenario. And I think what we've seen since 2008 are a variety of different geopolitical, and I intend in this first phase of my talk very brief talk to take that meaning quite seriously, of various types of geopolitical crisis originating out of this territory. And I think, broadly speaking, they come in the following flavours. So we have uh, a, a debt crisis leading to an unpleasant regime change. That would be Hungary. We have a financial pressure leading to erratic behaviour on, on the part of a regime that maintains itself in power. I think that's a pretty commonplace explanation of Putin's increasing aggression. We have the instance of a emerging market crisis creating a soft spot in the international order which then allows an aggressive powerful actor to predate which would be obviously Ukraine. We have the geopolitical shift produced by the massive preoccupation of a major partner or major ally with an emerging market crisis which I think is broadly speaking and I would insist on this the kind of story of the Eurozone. And then finally, and this is a point I think I was, I was also kind of harping on earlier, there's a question I think of the narrative. In other words, how can we get and how can one buy elite cooperation, say, uh, in a rapidly developing and strategically significant uh, emerging markets through the idea that the modernization process is credible? Um, and there, I think, uh, one thinks immediately of somewhere like Egypt, where whatever its future is, it's unlikely to be a return to the late Mubarak phase of kind of neoliberal integration. All sorts of other things are on the agenda, and they're thinkable because that other model broke. That's also my story for the Weimar Republic, and it would be my story for the Taisho era in Japan as well. When that global frame breaks, the elites begin to shift the kind of gambles that they're willing to engage in. So if we go back to this data here, and you were going to, you were going to ask yourself where the crisis management capacity of the dollar-based global financial system might be tested next, and you applied that kind of grid, you'd point to Turkey. You'd point to Turkey, and you'd keep pointing to Turkey. It's the one with the largest exposure in dollar terms. It's geopolitically significant. There's all sorts of potential ramifications that follow from it. But thinking uh, in broader terms, you might look at two other places. Um, and I'm suggesting these basically just to, it's another version of that bus, the trolley car. Like, what is the uh, deal-baking large-scale problem that might embarrass the dollar system and its managerial capacities? Turkey would certainly be in that category. Ukraine was bad enough, and that's a small-scale problem by the standards of Turkey. Two others which are in the frame, I think, are on the other hand, is Egypt, with its truly spectacular gamble on the IMF program it's engaged in now. Uh, Egypt is con currently running 30% plus annual inflation and consumer prices. That's a very dangerous experiment for a subsidy-dependent economy. And the other one would be Nigeria, which is in the front line of the global anti-terrorism war that's now uh, raging in Africa and has experienced a huge shock through the oil side and then through currency devaluation, a botched effort to peg the currency, then they let it go, and now they've tried to peg it again, 
Uh, these are the kind of places where I think we have to think about the possibility of an emerging market style crisis that would test hegemonic capacity. It's another scenario. It's not I'm going to say that this is how I expect it to fail, but I think in our thinking about what the system's capacities mean, these are also should be part of our picture. And historically, of course, they have been constitutive of what the managers of the dollar-based system since the 1980s thought of as being demonstrations of their capacities. If you think of the generation of American crisis managers who came up from the 1980s onwards, thought of themselves as being, they're the people who solved the emerging market crisis of the 80s and the 90s and so on. This was their test bed, this was their battleground. So at this point I want to move to the second phase of the talk, which is to ask a little bit about the question of of management and rules. So if you think about how we conventionally talk about the capacities of monetary systems and financial systems to cope with crisis, we think, I think, tend to think in terms of a simple schema of rules versus discretion. This is hugely commonplace in the Eurozone, and Bruno Meyer and James and Landau's book is a sort of almost stylized instance of it. I think too stylized, it's an under-complex account of the Eurozone crisis, but it exemplifies this. One of, the prob one of the questions it begs, I think, especially from a historian's point of view, is a two sort of the stuffing of these things. What is it that actually activates the agency and motivates it, other than some sort of cynical French willingness to do whatever it takes to survive their banks? Or, um, and what is it, what are the spirit of the laws? What, are the, what, in other words, gives the laws their binding capacity? You can make rules, but what makes it, what makes it attractive for people to stick to them? What are the resources that hang behind the institutional structure? So it's the question of structure and agency, but I'm asking, as it were, what is the content, and specifically the historical content at our moment? And I want to sort of offer a, a bold, to say the least. I can't really quite believe I'm appearing here as the culturalist in the room, but I'm going to do the kind of cultural turn on those two terms, and it's in a sense picking up exactly with one of Jacqueline's slides, which is that evidently one of the sources that we might be tempted to think on, if we're kind of telling a Nietzschean story about the emergence of the uh, crisis management capacity, the birth of the uh, crisis spirit of crisis management out of uh, the, con the spirit of Marvel comics. And I, I mean that actually quite literally, especially if you investigate the biographical background of the suburban American boys who come up in the 1960s. Their world is science fiction. Paul Krugman is particularly eloquent about this. Paul Krugman sees his road to the Nobel Prize as mapped by Isaac Asimov. Uh, and I th so a cultural historian would take this very literally. I'm not going to do that because I think there's an even more serious story here. But I think, uh, I think we, we all know, and you invoked it, we all spontaneously invoke it, central bankers are supermen. Um, and when you read somebody like Tim Geithner, who's obviously, you really do have a sense of this weird, like, uh, what's, uh, what's the superman guy who has a normal life, and then when he puts on his outfit, he's rescuing the world. That kind of inside-outside sense is really quite powerful. But what I want to point to is something more systematic than that, and it's really to do with the nature of the American state. Um, what are the sorts of stories with which people animate intervention uh, in this in this period? What are, where do they draw their where do they draw their inspiration from? And I want to go back to uh, a moment uh, in the early 1980s where uh, the young uh, Larry Summers uh, says this, and it goes directly to what Paul was saying. In other words, Larry Summers is articulating in the early 1980s the need for something that sits, as he puts it, between Henry Kissinger and Martin Feldstein. And the thing that will Feldstein, I'm sure, what will be between Kissinger and Feldstein is financial, well, what is it, statecraft, diplomacy? You put it in those terms. But if you actually think of the way in which American crisis fighters, the background they're coming from, the traumatic experience that shapes them is the crisis of the American state in the 1970s. And the moment, and insofar as it's inter inter international action is concerned, the defining experience is the quagmire of Vietnam. And the experience of the discovery, the rediscovery of state capacity and state agency in the 1980s, which culminates in the great moderation, the conquest of inflation, that exaggerated war against disorder fought with huge real interest rates, but also the Second Cold War, the buildup of American military strength, the victory over the Soviet Union, and then, of course, the explosive outpouring of American military power in the First Iraq War. Where this story actually leads you to is this recurring trope in the discussions of American crisis fighting, which suddenly takes on a deeper significance, um, which by way of, of course, the famous committee image here, these are the men of statecraft 
But that, that to me still is very much in the superhero mode. If you ask them what's actually making them tick, uh, they'll say this, the Powell Doctrine. Again and again and yeah, again. Exactly right. They say the Powell Doctrine. And exactly Colin Powell is, of course, the architect of the American military doctrine, which is supposed to release American power to be effective again. Right? It's supposed to give you the answer to the question of how you can be simultaneously all-powerful and yet fail in Vietnam. And the answer is you need massive force and exit strategy, clear conditions. And this echoes again and again. And astonishingly, it echoes on both sides of the spectrum. So I found this Stiglitz quote from 2010. I couldn't quite believe it. Stiglitz wants a Stiglitz-Krugman version of the Powell Doctrine. But the canonical text takes you straight back to the man I started with, which is Larry Summers, who in this famous meeting in a hotel in Washington on 18th of December 1997, poo-pooed Geithner, who was saying incrementally, incrementally, softly, softly with Korea, and said no, huge, right in, front-loaded, massive force. So that, for me, is a kind of articulation within the zone of the exception. What is it that we actually do there, right? And it isn't just law. There's actually, and not surprisingly, because historically this is the zone where this is thought, you go to the military because they are the people who operate perpetually <coughs> in the Clausewitzian space where it is the other who gives you the law and in which you escalate towards the absolute war as the obvious way to, to break your... So I think there's a very interesting kind of space that opens up here between the neo clausewitzian moment in American military doctrine of the 70s and 80s and are these kind of policy thinkers. Now, and that's part of the reason, I think, why they're so inimicable to the Germans who couldn't be more pacified and herbivorous if you, you know. <laughs> uh, the idea that this is how you talk about, you know, that you, this is how you talk about monetary policy. Schäuble always said, well, they're just ungoverned and, you know, actually they're at war. And this is part of the thing which makes uh, them so, so unpalatable. The question then, of course, is what is this sort of culture which is so specific to the narrative of America's state and its resurrection from the crisis of the 1970s, does it replicate forward? Does it pass forward? Is there, in the wake of the disasters of Iraq and Afghanistan, any kind of resource like this that you can point to? And it doesn't seem to me evident that there is, right? Maybe special forces, and I'll come back to that in a second, right? But there is a moment, I think, around 2010, 2011, when the only bits of the American state that seem to work are the Fed and special forces. Truly, like Bernanke and killing uh, Osama bin Laden, that's kind of where the American state is efficacious, and, and there's, a, there's a further implication to that, which is structural and goes to the structural side. So if we think about the institutional structure of crisis fighting since 2008, what is it that makes us feel comfortable that we can even talk, really, about the survival of the dollar order? And this is where, like I just thought, okay, I've just been perfectly set up. It's the swap line story. Right? Insofar as we think that the dollar order has shown real creativity, it's in the fact that the, the, that the swap lines were infused with huge extra. It was an existing institution. We knew how to do this. And suddenly, from 2007, it pops back to life. And it becomes, de facto, the Bretton Woods Conference that never happened with its institutionalization in October 2013. Unlimited swap lines between the core six central banks. It's as though Bretton Woods happened and no one was invited, right? And they, just, they just didn't tell us that they were building a new dollar-centered system founded on swap lines. So the kind of question, if you keep pushing at this intertext between strategy, uh, between militarism and um, a monetary policy that that comes to mind is, so which bit of the development of the American national security apparatus are swap lines like? Right? If Geithner thinks he's cool in Powell, what system is Bernanke operating? And it seems to me inescapable if you start asking this slightly perverse question. And of course, analogies are dangerous, right? Because, like, what is Trump like? Well, all sorts of things. So, uh, it's a nasty parlor game, but I mean it seriously because I think it points to structural changes with the American state. The real question is, are the swap lines a little bit like the NSA? Right? Um, now, there's actually a kind of non-trivial overlap in that one of the things the NSA ended up doing was eavesdropping on Angela Merkel during the Eurozone crisis. And frankly, all power to them, because if anyone could tell us what the hell was going on inside Berlin during the Eurozone crisis, I want spies too. Right? <laughs> like, please, we need to bug a lot of them. Um, um, but, the, but more seriously, right, it seems to me there's a variety of really quite structural analogies between 
a powerful and yet in fundamentally ways constrained and not solidly founded type of power that has taken shape during the crisis. Right? We all agree they're hugely efficacious. I would argue that they're already having geopolitical consequences and were from the start evidently going to have geopolitical consequences and they came, as Dan was emphatically emphasising, out of a thinking of policy which at least back to the 80s and 90s was already geopolitical. Um, we know, we are, we, most of us think they're essential for crisis fighting, right? We, we can't really tell the story without them. And yet, uh, they're not exactly secret. And of course, Bernanke and all of his defenders will go to their grave saying they never made any secret out of them. They just didn't really tell anyone, right? There was no coming out party for the swap lines. No champagne bottles were cracked. They weren't named anything. Um, and it's very unclear, I think, what the democratic response would be. And I think it's important to say we shouldn't go with a sort of populist knee-jerk that says they're evidently illegitimate and that everyone instantly would recognise this and it would be a disaster. It's quite possible that people, as they did with the NSA, would just shrug and go, hell, yeah, we need to do this. This is important. Like, bugging terrorists is probably a good thing. In the same way as majorities would, in fact, support the Muslim ban. Majorities of Americans think it's a good thing, despite our liberal outrage. What we can be pretty certain about is that there's no evident substantial democratic constituency for them. It's not evident that there's any block that would mobilise around them. So there is very serious political risk, which everyone so far has chosen not to chart or explore. That's okay, the minimal statement we can make about them. So we don't know, and yet we think they're essential. We built them. We don't really know where we stand with regard to their legitimation. The people I've talked to in the New York Fed are very nervous about them and said that they felt that they had a guardian angel on Capitol Hill who was keeping it out of the discussion in 2008. And it's that weird metaphor of like a kind of guardian angel. That's, you know, we're in pretty bizarre territory. But anyway, one could imagine various bad scenarios. The minimal one is the sort of Eurozone politics, which is nationalism, bank, you know, bank on bank. That's kind of, I think, fairly straightforward, and one might be able to handle that. Hell, if you don't want a swap line, live without it. That's fine. Yeah? Uh, a slightly spookier version is the famous graffiti on the ECB building, where Germany is not opposed to the system, but somehow in cahoots with it and locked with it, and that is the Merkel-Draghi axis. But this is the real nightmare. Right? This is the Spiegel's fantastic cover on the NSA. And what is nightmarish about it is that the the NSA is inside the Reichstag. It isn't as though anyone is saying the Germans are victims of the NSA. It's one bit of Germany which has instrumentalized the Americans without asking the rest um, and has constituted a power complex which is everywhere, which has America on it, and yet is not really fully legitimated. Now, if the politics of money went in this direction, it seems to me we would really be in a complex space in which we would be in a situation of functional independence, interdependence, a form of dominance, you might argue, in Bavarian terms at least. People are doing things for, uh, uh, under the outside pressure, but without essentially the functions of legitimacy. And that, I think, is where at least we have left ourselves. It's possible that there's a good path out of here. I, I think Jacqueline's kind of openness here. But the risk of this kind of trajectory is that. That would be my uh, w w part of the answer, I think, to the fragility of the uh, dollar order in present, that it is vulnerable to this kind of, um, in the same way as the NSA was, it's vulnerable to this kind of uh, escalating. Before we over, just to clarify that last point, because I want to get this right in my head, but could it not be the case that moving in that direction is actually just another example of strengthening it? rather than weakening. Well, you can go in different directions. So far, the NSA story hasn't worked out terribly well for anyone, right? But I, I'm not, I, I, what I'm trying to do is navigate between the simple leftist critique of, you know, um, uh, technocratic decision-making. That, 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 I can see the force of that, but we now know also its demagogic potential. Uh, that's our embarrassment when Bannon shows up on the same side of the argument. Yeah. Um, um, but I think just as a historical observation about the context in which swap lines were made and other things I think of a structurally similar type and the kind of politicization they were subject to, uh, and if, say, and this, is, uh, this will be my absolutely final point, if people like Eikenberry insist that American power is secure because it has alliances and other people don't, and you put the NSA story into that, the nature of those alliances is not as self-evident as some like, someone like him would like. And they can be either collectively re-legitimizing or, however, caught in a spiral of collective delegitimization, which I think is what we've seen with the NSA. Yeah. 
So when you have Bretton Woods and no one's invited, it's fine so long as it works and no one knows. Once everybody calls you on that, you're incredible. Output legitimacy is a huge issue here as well. Yeah. Right. yeah. Cool. And so the, they may work, but they really do need to work. Actually, I know you, you should go. Yeah. No, you should go because I follow your argument okay. logically. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, first of all, thanks, Sylvia and Mark, for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Um, actually, also, thanks to Adam because it's really a nice um, kind of flow here, I think, through the NSA story. Um, basically, uh, the purpose of my paper was to think a bit uh, broader about US hegemony in, in global mm -hmm. finance, and it's uh, usually done. Because uh, I think basically my, my argument is that if you analyze the US in, a low, in an isolation, it kind of misses the bigger picture. And, um, I think that um, we should really see the U.S. as strongly and deeply integrated with the Anglophone countries and territories, so UK, Canada, Australia, but also all the offshore centers. And um, one obvious observation is, is the cooperation in the, the Five Eyes uh, intelligence uh, field. I think no other group of countries cooperates in such a sensitive field. So. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, I think, crucial, but also politically, financially. Um, and that's, I think that changes the bigger picture of uh, U.S. hegemony. Um, these are some results from a, from a paper published in a Review of International Studies. Basically, what I did was a very broad picture, um, structural power of Anglo-America in, in global finance. And what I did was to, to very broadly track the, the share of, of Anglo-American nine key um, segments of global finance throughout uh, about 10, 15 years, depends on the data. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but it's, it's derivatives, foreign exchange, uh, market cap of listed corporations, uh, portfolio investment, direct investment, basically all the indicators um, that are out there. Also financial wealth uh, by Credit Suisse. Um, and when you do this very broad analysis, um, you find that in all these segments, um, Anglo-America is very stable and has even managed to increase its, its global share in the, from basically roughly 2000 to 2015. Um, there are some interesting nuances because in some segments, the UK is still very, very strong. Um, foreign exchange trading, derivatives, etc. The city is still uh, very powerful globally. Um, but yeah, when you look at these segments, there is really no competitor uh, in sight. Um, and I think this very, very broad visualization is, is also helpful there um, to show the bigger picture. It's um, a visualization of portfolio investment, direct investment, and banking claims. Uh, data is a little bit old because it's, uh, it's a bit laborious to, to collect this. Um, one take is virtually every country you look at, the largest bilateral financial relation they have is either with the US or with another Anglophone country. Um, for Germany, for France, Japan especially. And also gives you some nice uh, details, for example, Japan has invested uh, about 700 billion in the Cayman Islands. Um, and the visualiz visualization shows you that probably most of this is kind of indirectly towards the US. So it gives kind of rich, um, rich detailed picture. And of course, uh, the biggest bilateral financial tie in the globe is between the US and the UK, um, which is remarkable, I think, because if you compare the, the UK to Japan or others, just the size of the economy, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't intuitively think that. And it's still the case today, so the data hasn't changed that much. And China's you know, barely visible. It's gotten a little bit bigger in the last years because it's now reporting also portfolio investment to the IMF, but still very, very marginal. Uh, we had this already, I think. It's just uh, 
the share of uh, foreign exchange reserves very stable over this period. Um, also, if you visualize it from the uh, data from the BIS, I think it's very intuitive. Foreign, foreign exchange sharing is basically a Hubble spoke model or, or kind of how it works. Everybody goes through the dollar uh, from virtually every currency. But, um, well, I came up, it's very, very preliminary here in the paper. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward for comments and ideas. Um, I came up with this kind of new term or metaphor, Anglo America's sticky global financial ecosystem, because I think it's, it's not just the US and the dollar and the US uh, financial markets, but also if you look at financial actors, and we've been touched upon this a little bit before. Um, so who are the actors? Where are the based? Uh, I think it's, it's a really important thing not to look at national aggregates, but also at financial actors. Um, I did this for, for asset management broadly. I think you can, you can divide it into three segments, more or less a high fee segment, hedge funds, private equity funds, a medium fee segment, and a low fee segment. And virtually, well, high fee segment hedge funds they are a purely Anglo-American Anglo financial industry um, based virtually only in New York and London and, and domiciled in the Cayman Islands. A British territory equity funds, a little bit less so, but still uh, it's a very, very strong dominance. Um, also medium fee segment, if you look at the top 500 global asset managers. Um, actually, I think these are the oldest slides, but okay, I have some little bit more details there. About two thirds of all the assets under management by the top 500 uh, are managed by by <coughs> firms in U.S., U.K., Canada, etc. So I think this is really extraordinary uh, dominance in the field of financial actors. What is specifically interesting is the low fee segment, uh, passive index funds. Um, in Amsterdam, we've published a, a new paper on this. What we call the big three. So it's uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street. Um, there's been a huge shift in investment since the crisis from actively managed funds to passive funds. And um, those three together, I think they have more than 10 trillion of assets mm -hmm. under management, so more than the whole sovereign wealth fund um, industry, if you would combine that, it's very heterogeneous. Um, and the growth is still continuing, so it's a massive shift of investment, also a massive shift of, of uh, corporate ownership and potential corporate control. And those three are all based in the US, so it's purely US actors there. Um, but also if you look at offshore financial centers, so Cayman Islands, Bermuda, British Virgin Islands, Jersey, Guernsey, they play really important roles in certain segments of finance. Um, I would argue that, for example, the Cayman Islands, in, so in certain segments, is uh, the third largest jurisdiction in the world, with certain uh, banking statistics, portfolio investment, four trillion, uh, two to three trillion. Um, I would argue this is only possible because it's under British sovereignty, because it provides stability, you know, a stable legal system. Uh, this wouldn't be possible in, in Panama or Belize or um, somewhere else. So I think this is really crucial. And if we exclude these centers, then we kind of miss the bigger picture. Um, the era of secular stagnation, um, well, I think the low growth, low inflation, low interest rate is probably here to stay. Um, what does it mean? Probably a quite massive shift to equity markets as uh, pension funds, etc., cetera, are, are looking for, for yield. Uh, they probably shift to equity markets and U.S. and Anglo-American equity markets are really dominant globally as well, about 50% of the global market capitalization. Um, so probably I would think this will, this will strengthen the US system. Chinese market cap, cap has been growing in recent years, but it's still virtually sealed off. Um, and I mean, who want to, to put a sizable stake of the pension funds to a Chinese system when you don't know how we can you know, sell and, and get out? So it's, uh, it's not really a rival rival there, I think. Um, 
yeah, well, these were the older slides. I had another one, but I don't know, some other weeks up. Thanks. Yeah, not the creative title. <laughs> 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 I'm in a rush. <laughs> <laughs> Although my paper was the first one to get sent in, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I want to thank Jan for advancing his thing, be, um, because partly because mine builds on his, uh, quite obviously, and um, also aside from thanking uh, uh, Sylvia and uh, Mark for inviting me up, um, I also want to thank Sylvia and Ian for setting up a lot of what I'm talking about because we were basically arguing about the same things and although as, it, as may be apparent, we disagree a little bit on the implications, um, I think this disagreement is not 0, 100, but maybe 40, 60 in terms of um, what uh, all this means uh, for the long-term stability of the dollar. And I also want to thank the presentation um, by Adam because um, uh, it very nicely picked up what, what Jackie said. And what I'm going to talk about is, in some sense, um, uh, 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 why we should think about um, the, the um, stability of the U.S. dollar as the international reserve currency as a function of the operation of a whole set of asymmetries that are linked to the fact that the U.S. is an empire. So if I say to you that um, uh, uh, the U.S. dollar is central because most other uh, banking systems in the world have become Canadianized. Um, I think the Canadians, only the Canadians maybe will really get this, and the, although there's a few of you there, but that's basically what I'm saying. The dollar is central because the rest of the world has become Canadianized. And I don't know, I don't know how this works. Oh, there we go. All right. So the short, the, um, the short version uh, uh, of the argument is that um, the centrality of the dollar that we saw in um, foreign exchange trading, which we um, didn't see but which actually exists um, in trade finance, um, and the fact that the U.S. economy is both large and uh, tends to grow faster um, than the other major economies, um, notwithstanding the optimistic claim that you made uh, in eight of the last four, in eight, in six of the last eight quarters, the U.S. outgrew the Eurozone. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. just a blip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a blip. Yeah. Okay. Um, the fact <laughs> yeah. that the U.S. I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The fact that, well. It's the story that counts. Yeah. Yeah, it's the story. Yeah, it's yeah. the story. Yeah. yeah. Give, us, give us the blip. The blip. Uh, I'll give you the blip. Um, the two out of the eight. <laughs> okay. um, the U.S. economy grows, is large. It grows faster. And what that means is that... Um, Banks um, find themselves, banks outside the U.S. find themselves with large dollar-denominated positions on both sides of their balance sheet. Um, and um, this means that they end up having to rely on the Fed um, to bail them out in uh, event of a crisis. And the language I prefer to use here is that um, the Fed is the only potential creator of outside money for the global financial system. Mm -hmm. And uh, that may not mean anything to you, but the translation of that into the language we've used here is that it's the Fed that organizes the swap lines. Um, and the, the swap lines um, are um, the, the, um, the reason the dollar stays central. If you're stuck with big dollar positions, you are um, vulnerable um, to um, a crash on the asset side of your balance sheet. And when that happens, it's only the Fed that can bail you out by creating more dollars. And that's what we saw in 08. Um, it's what we saw in the crises uh, before then. Um, and it will probably continue um, uh, for the foreseeable future, although I will put the usual Trump asterisk behind that statement. Um, and this, this tends to produce um, what I call, for lack of a better phrase, bicycle stability um, in, uh, for the US dollar. As long as the US economy um, keeps growing faster relatively, and it's relative, right? It's not, it's, it's not that the US um, uh, is really growing all that fast, but it doesn't matter. If it's the US versus Italy, you can see um, relatively it's faster. As long as the US economy is growing faster, then um, uh, things will hold together um, because um, foreigners will continue to accumulate these large dollar positions. And you can see that right, he um, 
so the two things you can see here, one is the balance sheet uh, effect. This is, um, <coughs> this is uh, the share of uh, US dollars in cross-border uh, liabilities for banks um, whose uh, nationality is in these countries that are indicated. And then at the end, it's the euro and yen positions for US uh, nationally, national banks. Um, you can see they're, they're, they're quite large, and then that also shows up in their positions uh, uh, globally um, with uh, quite um, large asymmetric flows. So I'll just point, yeah, this is good. This one here, just look at this one from, from Europe to the US, right? So there's about a trillion dollars of um, lending in dollars to Europe from the US, but there's about $1.8 trillion of lending from, the US, from Europe to the US in dollars. Right? So the Europeans have this large unrequited um, uh, liability, and it makes, it makes those banks vulnerable. And that also makes uh, the economies vulnerable because um, unlike the US, um, corporate finance in Europe is still very much dependent on banks as opposed to securities markets. And so that this big blue thing right here, right, that's securitized lending. And what you see for Europe, with a little bit of an exception for the UK, is it's coming from banks. Um, when bond markets, when bonds crash, banks walk away and don't, investment banks walk away and don't care. It's the widows and orphans who suffer. But when banks' balance sheets crash, um, the economy goes, which is why Bernanke, et cetera, is a hero. So, um, so everyone else has become, uh, to go back to the original sort of throwaway line, everyone else has become Canadianized. Um, they need the Fed to bail them out by, a, um, by um, keeping the dollar central. They lower the uh, cost of funding in the US and enable the US to engage in that global arbitrage that produces the funny balance sheet um, at a national level that uh, Ian and Sylvia talked about and that I talked a little bit about uh, in the subprime book. Um, and that it then enables the US to run an enormous um, uh, positive uh, income statement uh, on its net international position, despite an equally enormous um, net negative international investment position. Um, and um, so the US economy grows fast, and American firms are highly profitable. And so this is not quite up to date, um, but you'll get a sense of. Uh, uh, the difference in aggregate national level growth. If you look at this column, you'll see the US is not that outstanding per capita growth, but from the point of view of investors, what they care about is that first column. So you invest in the US. To invest in the US, you have to borrow dollars. Um, you build up those positions. And that then produces um, a situation in which the US borrows cheaply from the world and then invests um, outward. And um, these are aggregate numbers on profitability for the 2,000 largest firms in the world. It's the Forbes Global 2000. Um, and the first column is the share of profits uh, cumulatively uh, over that decade, 05 to 15, um, uh, among the, the Forbes Global 2000. And then compared to share of global GDP, and I give you the ratio in case you can't do this math in your head. Um, and Right? That's, and that's because that's the important column. Right? This is the disproportionate thing. So if you're an investor, where are you going to put your money? Right? You're going to, oh, we're going to buy American, we're going to buy, try to buy shares in American firms, or we're going to invest in the American economy. It's where the profits are. It's where the um, growth is. And the problem with that in the long run, um, of course, is that this relies on the, and this is precisely what the uh, Maxfield Hardy paper is getting at. The US accumulates this large negative um, net, in, net international investment position, um, which is sustainable only as long as American firms and the American economy continue to outperform. And right now, um, that outperformance is a function of an incredibly um, concentrated set of firms who are accumulating uh, profits on the basis of monopoly positions in markets secured through intellectual property rights. So just to give you a sense of this, but you know this if you know the firms uh, that I'm going to, that, that, that come to mind right away, which are Apple, Google, Facebook, Pfizer, Johnson, Johnson. If you take that uh, Forbes Global 2000, um, the top 25 US firms in the Forbes Global 2000, okay, um, account for about 13.5% of those cumulative profits I had in the prior slide. 
and um, if you, um, yeah, sorry, in this slide, and um, they account for 41% of all profits of the almost 600 US firms in the Forbes Global 2000. And if you take the larger universe of publicly listed firms with sales over $200 million, um, which is about 28,000 firms, they actually account for 4.5%. So 25 US firms, a really small fraction of all firms, are a huge percentage of all profits. And the weakness of the American position, aside from the Trump asterisk, is precisely that the profitability of those firms is purely political. It's a function of the security of those intellectual property rights. It's not about some kind of production expertise. And we can argue about whether, where real value is created, but I don't actually care. The question is, how does value get distributed? And the way it's distributed is through those IPRs, and that's a function of trade, oh, trade treaties. And that's where the Trump asterisk becomes relevant, but it's also connected to why you have Trump, which is that concentration of profits then flows into an enormous inequality of income, and it's why the bottom 80% of the US population um, has seen basically stagnant incomes for 30 years. Uh, so, so there is an endogenous process of decay in the American empire, um, which is why, to go back to the 60-40 thing, why Maxwell Hardy uh, say 40% and I say 60%, it's not, and that's why I don't say 100%, even though the beginning of the paper is very optimistic, cheerful about uh, structural power for the US. Okay, thanks. Now we can, by the way, yeah. The really dark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can. If you haven't plumbed the depths of darkness, I can. I can. I can. I can. I can see my work is cut out for me. Um, so, as everybody's mentioned, thanks so much for inviting me to participate in in this event, which I very much appreciate. And uh, fortuitously, um, I frame my talk around the three general questions uh, that we were asked about the conference. So going last, that works out to remind you of the, what the three general questions were. Just keep an eye on my own time. How stable is the US order? Uh, will the ongoing political crisis and economic recession in the Eurozone and geopolitical changes in East Asia prolong or threaten the US order? And is there a new geopolitic, geopolitics emerging underneath this financial system? And if so, what does it look like? So I'm going to take on each of those questions and then do a little bit more. It shouldn't take that long at all. Uh, question one, uh, stability. Uh, to appeal to any declension of the word stable is to fail to begin to capture what the hell is going on in the world right now. The U.S. order, constructed after the Second World War and adjusted to taste regularly like the color controls on those RCA TVs, and then, if I can torture this metaphor, had the volume turned up with the end of the Cold War and the American embrace of globalization, that order is over. Okay, what we are doing now is there's a train. It's jumped the tracks, and it's heading into a gully. And this is the interim. We're watching the train. We're aghast and watching the train. And it will take an exhaustion the shock, and that train will crash. But that's the moment that we're in, watching this train and waiting for the crash. That is of the American order. I'm not speaking about the economy uh, writ large, but, but the American order. And this derailment. Uh, has been some time in coming, at least uh, from the global financial crisis, which gave a good rattle uh, to the U.S. order. But at the moment of the crisis, outstanding public policy prevented the Second Great Depression, and it really was quite outstanding. Unfortunately, dismal public policy uh, followed in the wake uh, of that success. Um, sheltering the perpetuators of the catastrophe and leaving an inherently fragile and utterly dysfunctional financial system unreformed, and it also proved ultimately indifferent to the misery visited on those most affected by the Great Recession that ensued. And so you can draw a straight line from the global financial crisis and the political management not of the crisis, which was nifty, but the aftermath of that crisis to the rise of Donald Trump. I don't know which is more responsible for Trump, the global financial crisis, or Twitter. But either way, <laughs> this administration, with its skeptical, short-sighted, transactional approach to relations with traditional allies, 
simply will not provide the systemic supports necessary to sustain any consistent order, especially in moments of crisis, and it is in moments of crisis when such supports are needed most. Moreover, if you thought I was being a little pessimistic, let me continue. <laughs> there, there is no comfort to be taken in the possibility that in a few years, Trump might be thrown out on his ear and a new president with more traditional foreign policy visions might come back and restore the old regime. Uh, this hope of many holds some truth with regard to domestic politics, right? Taxes that are lowered can be raised, environmental regulations that are gutted can be restored, meals can be put back on wheels, but international politics is different. There are no backseas in international politics. In questions pertaining to world politics, other states must always assess what other states are capable of and orient their own expectations and policies accordingly. The stakes in an anarchic world are simply too high for them to fail to do that. And from now on and for a very long time, all actors in the world must calculate their interests with an understanding that this is what America can produce, that America has chosen as its leader an ignorant, nativist, white nationalist xenophobe who views allies, allies, with suspicion at best. Okay? It is as if Philip Roth's novel has come to life and Charles Lindbergh is our president. But regardless of our personal political reactions to this development, which are largely irrelevant, my point here is that every country in the world must now assess their interests understanding this reality, this novel reality. This is new and this is different. For example, unrelated to the interests of most of us at this workshop, it seems likely that this sort of thing will be an accelerant for nuclear proliferation because states around the world, I think, are going to become less confident about the inviolability of U.S. security commitments and nudge them in the direction of trying to establish their own nuclear deterrence. You know, we'll see. So, question one, how stable is the U.S. order? Uh, my answer, <laughs> put a fork in it. It's done. Uh, question two, uh, will the ongoing political crisis in the Eurozone and geopolitical in East Asia prolong or threaten the U.S. order? Hey, here's a surprise. <laughs> put me down for threatened. <laughs> um, on the one hand, uh, the mess in Europe and geopolitical tension in East Asia will, all other things constant, bolster the still dominant role of the U.S. dollar. Uh, for rather straightforward reasons, there's no need to elaborate here during these brief comments. Happy to talk about these more. And I should mention that I continue to cling with the tenacity of a stubborn toddler to the view that over time there will be a relative diminution in the Greenback's international role. <laughs> <laughs> But that is different than the fate of the U.S. order in general. That is the endurance of the dollar's international role and the fate of the U.S. order. Uh, Europe's crisis and America's attitude towards it, geopolitical tensions in Asia and America's contribution to them, those, I think, further threaten the U.S. order. Uh, the current administration is hostile to the EU, coolly disposed toward Germany, ambivalent about NATO, and indifferent at best to the rise of illiberalism and authoritarianism on the continent. It would seem obvious to me that these are the opposite of the pillars that form the foundations uh, of, the, of the American order we're supposed to be talking about being sustained or not, and therefore can but only serve to undermine the endurance of such an order. In Asia, it's a little more complicated because traditionally geopolitical tensions there have served to bolster the U.S. position, again, for rather traditional <coughs> security studies reasons, so one might anticipate that tensions there might prolong the American order, but to the extent to which the new administration values, quote, unpredictability as its signature calling card, this is just not uh, something that states uh, tend to find appealing uh, in a security partner during a crisis. And so I think with regard to Asia, the outcomes here are indeterminate with regard to the future of the American order. Much depends on who gets into a militarized confrontation with whom and how the Americans unpredictably react to that to see what it will be the fate of the American order. As for what the emerging system will look like, I can only invoke what Marlena Dietrich said to Orson Welles in Touch of Evil. You're a mess, honey. <laughs> Why? Why is the emerging order uh, likely to be a mess? Uh, so here is where I touch on some of these issues um, in my paper, so I will quickly highlight some of the core concepts. Starting with the view that cooperative governance of international macroeconomic issues is inherently hard, and I think Europe 
Europe's problems illustrate the difficulties associated with this type of cooperation. Why? Why? I mean, sure, cooperation is hard, but why is this especially hard in the international macroeconomic realm? I think this is rooted in the adjustment problem, managing the burdens of adjustment that are inevitably generated by naturally occurring macroeconomic processes. This is the stuffing of macroeconomic governance. These burdens can be severe and salient. Uh, this is something I think we can attribute to Keynes and his early writings. And as you know, I'm happy to talk more about Keynes uh, at, at your leisure, um, but I will move on. I think the point of invoking Keynes here is that in terms of macroeconomic governance, we should see cooperation as the special, not the general case. Mm -hmm. And this is what some of the things I raised in the paper and speaks to uh, what special conditions allow for cooperation to occur. And how would we assess where they're standing right now in the world economy? Um, first, it's important to remember what we were told earlier this morning, which is that all monetary orders rest on political foundations, so you have to look at the international politics. This, of course, is Bob, although Bob got that from E.H. Carr, uh, but I think they're both right, and I think that the international political order is shifting, so we should in anticipate some shifts in the international macroeconomic order as well if Bob and Carr are right. Secondly, uh, shared ideas about money can be very helpful in smoothing over disagreements. Uh, this I attribute to Kate. Um, and in my view, um, and I recognize that this position is contested by some of us here, we are in a period of increased heterogeneity of thinking with regard to how to best manage monetary affairs. So another possible sal salve, S-A-L-V-E, salve, to uh, international macroeconomic uh, cooperation has also been stripped away from us. Third, we have Uncle Charlie, right? Kindleberger tells us that a benign leader can provide international public goods necessary to sustain international cooperation. Do we see that benign international leader eager to provide international public goods? Uh, fourth, shared sale and security concerns can grease the wheels of monetary cooperation by nesting those costs uh, in the context of more urgently held goals that states hold. I attribute this idea to me, uh, and I think this indeed was the underappreciated case for much of the cooperation that took place during the American order and about a decade even before that American order formed, and I think this also no longer holds. Items three and four call attention to something that I think much of contemporary political science scholarship fails to account for, which is the distinction between power and purpose. Actually, most of the people in this room are not guilty of that, um, but the discipline as a whole sort of is. Um, and the, the point is, and this gets to the Trump asterisk, which I think is a big asterisk, uh, uh, raw American power has not changed much uh, in the past couple of years, um, but its purpose is un undergoing a potentially radical transformation, mm -hmm. and in ways that speak against, not for, the prospects for the maintenance of the old American order and for a comity and cooperation in international monetary and financial affairs uh, more generally. I don't know where I am on the clock, but I was planning on turning more narrowly to your long and long and low. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm already suicidal heading for a drink, so keep going. All right. I don't, <laughs> this, I don't know if this is quite as bad, so. All right. So I then wanted to turn to the questions that were posed directly uh, to this panel, um, which had to do with what might be the consequences uh, if we remain in the, a world in which inflation and interest rates uh, remain quite low. And happily, my views here on this are mixed. Uh, <laughs> on the one hand, th these conditions have been, uh, to some extent, a gift, right? Very low interest rates have taken the edge off some of the fiscal pressures that would have emerged had states been required to service their increased debt obligations uh, at higher rates. And, and I think this is underappreciated, had there been the threatened spikes in inflation that occurred, there would have likely been extraordinarily bitter contestations within states because central banks would have saw the need to move aggressively to suppress this inflation whilst real economies remained anemic. And so that would have been a kind of bitter political conflict between the instinct to fight inflation into what would remain a very sluggish economic growth. On the other hand, uh, these low rates have given us some problems of their own and masked other consequential political conflicts that will soon likely loom larger. Um, 
With regard to the former, very low inflation, as we know, has essentially taken away the normal practice of monetary policy, which has been the most significant lever kind of a public policy making, actually, over the past 30 years. And if I may take a, a moment, uh, it turns out that those of us in lonely descent in the 1990s who argued that monetary policy had become biased in favor of reducing inflation rates to suboptimally low levels were right. And exactly, this was one of the reasons we gave for why extremely low levels of inflation were actually bad things. And I'm happy to elaborate on this old fight uh, in, in Q&A. In any event, the effective loss of interest rate manipulation has complicated domestic monetary management and the prospects for international policy coordination. And again, this leads to a number of technical issues about the public external nature of interest rate and exchange rate policies that complicate questions of international cooperation uh, in this area that are exacerbated uh, by the loss of access to traditional standards of the practice of monetary policy. I think these low rates of in interest and inflation rates have also masked enduring political contestation that will um, reemerge in the future, again, perhaps more sharply, um, as things start, when things begin to turn uh, back towards normal. And this has to do with the, the politics of low inflation and the overselling uh, of independent central banks. These issues uh, captured in my old catchphrase that very much failed to sweep the nation, uh, ambiguous economics, ubiquitous politics, meaning here that with regard to monetary policy, most practical choices on the menu have economic distinctions that are fairly modest and uncertain, but political consequences that are large and sharp. And so when we start to talk about independent central banks, um, we will get into the conflict over continuing to pretend that independent central banks are somehow apolitical, when in fact, no matter how independent you make central banks, every choice they make will have profound political consequences. Worse, especially in the American context, uh, I can't speak to other contexts as confidently, um, the central banking community is so intimately enmeshed with the private financial sector that it is something of a joke to really bandy about the phrase independent when you talk about independent central banks because you really begs the question, independent, you know, from whom? Um, and this returns me to where I started, uh, which is that measures taken by central bankers during the global financial crisis were crucial and successful in helping the world avoid another Great Depression. And that's a really big deal and it hugely mattered. Uh, but those central bankers continue to share champagne and caviar with the same unpunished, unrepentant, unreformed bankers that they are nominally tasked with, if utterly disinterested in, supervising. And it is this that has contributed to the understandable, if incoherent and misdirected, rage that has brought dangerous faux populists like Donald Trump and others to power. And even I, a critic of the oversold false promise of the fetidization of central bank independence, I am not looking forward to early next year when President Trump replaces Janet Yellen with some golfing buddy who will be the equivalent of Arthur Burns to Trump's Nixon. That will not be a good thing. Uh, and to the extent that there is a more general populist or authoritarian reassertion of authority over monetary more generally, that also would probably lead to the poor practice of monetary policy and make productive policy cooperation and coordination between nations um, and the ability to provide emergency assistance to each other in times of need, which has been the hallmark of central bank cooperation for at least 150 years, um, much less possible. And on that happy note, uh, I will stop. So glad to see you really well yeah. taking us off there. It was a false leap. <laughs> you know, it's, it, there was the dark side. That was great. So we know that Adam has to go soon. So let's get straight to questions. If you have questions directly to Adam, that would be helpful. We can go there first if you've got to go. Yeah, but good, actually. We've been, we've been great. Yeah, we've done right, really well. Case, then let's just open it up. We want to go first. I've got Paul, the central bank, for being beaten up there. So we'll go with the central bank at first, and then over there with Sylvia. So there are two things that you said that I think were very striking um, in, a, in terms of the transatlantic um, contrast. Um, the Superman thing, uh, which carries on in a way, um, this is slightly unkind, in the title of Ben's book, mm -hmm. Courage to Act. Yes, there, were, there were three, there were, well, I was one of them, there were two other very senior European summer bankers. 
sitting around when the book came out. Let's speak up a bit. Speak we, up. we said, oh dear. Yeah. And I think I think that's how we reacted when Maestro came out. That's why we reacted when those those um, magazine covers um, came out. And up to a point, you can stop that happening. Um, so this is, the, and I don't think this is specific to them as individuals, and I don't, I doubt it is specific to the Federal Reserve or the U.S. Treasury as a culture. But I think there's a really interesting question about why unelected officials want to parade themselves in this country. The same question could be made about members of the Supreme Court um, compared with the members of either our Supreme Court or the Constitutional Court in um, Germany. And, and, and you know, there are going to be quite interesting reasons behind that. The second thing is the Powell Doctrine. I absolutely recognize that. And, and that gang having talked about it for years. So here's a fact. And it doesn't fit with the story, but I think the story is right. So the fact is kind of, so who are these people with the Powell bazooka? So that there was overwhelming force in terms of supporting, underpinning the banking system in the autumn fall of 2008 was not a US initiative. It was Gordon Brown taking it to Angela Merkel and Sarkozy, pushed very much by Mervyn. I mean, Mervyn was, it's a solvency crisis, and they don't get it. They think it's a liquidity crisis. He thought it was a solvency crisis all along. Um, they don't get it. They absolutely have to do something. We all have to do something. And Gordon was absolutely terrific. Um, I was, by pure chance, I was in number 10 when he kind of fought himself um, into a Eurogroup meeting. Now, the puzzle this presents is what is it to have this image of Superman with a bazooka? And yet, when the moment comes for you to fire it, all of these, you know, supposedly pathetic people on the other side of the Atlantic fly over by chance for, you know, the gods had arranged a G7 or G20 meeting around then, which is one of the many proofs of the existence of God. Um, and and the then president um, embraced it. Someone said earlier, Bush was against doing these things. I don't think that's true at all. Um, but it wasn't initiated by people in office here. And I'm, and I'm absolutely, Adam, not challenging your story. It's kind of, how does this really fit together? I think that's a great, may, may I, I'll just respond. I mean, I, the, the bazooka image is funny because it's a notoriously ineffectual and dangerous weapon. <laughs> <laughs> no one in their right mind, no one, whereas the power doctrine is, is actually a piece of American military doctrine. And the bazooka image is Paulson's, and it's really in the summer, and it's about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Yeah. You could argue that they did fix that, right? No, I agree with that. I mean, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's astonishing, because unlike TARP, they asked for totally unlimited appropriation, yeah. right? TARP yeah. was 700 billion, and that freaked people out. Fannie yeah. Mae and Freddie Mac is unlimited. Yeah, and carries on. So, in a sense, they got the, the huge hit early. But then I think, with the entire episode, crucially around Lehman, what we're dealing with is retrospective efforts by people like Geithner to stitch the story back together again after what was clearly a miscarriage of policy in their, in their own retrospective terms. In yeah. other words, yeah. things went very badly wrong with Lehman. There were huge political constraints on Paulson and Geithner, I think. Well, Paulson and Bernanke, I'm convinced personally, though people obviously differ about this. And the question is how you then subsequently, it's more like the Rahm Emanuel, how do you how do you put this crisis to work for something afterwards? And I think in Geithner's post-crisis state-building efforts, which culminate in the treasury design for Dodd-Frank, which is really about supervisorial discretion, the ramp, not, you know, you're not trying to actually change the structure of the system very much. You're trying to make it more transparent by way of the stress testing and the capital plans. And then you're really trying to build the authority of the American state to act. Um, that, I think, is where this kind of rhetoric becomes very persuasive. But the other place, of course, that it has huge efficacy is that again directed against the Europeans and the Eurozone afterwards, right? So it then becomes a way of marking the difference between the American solution, which is itself really a complicated story, which is patched together from the summer of 2009 as a highly successful crisis fighting strategy, 
Um, and that is then directed at the Europeans, but in a very funny way, because the Europeans, to my, so the Americans, to my mind, become the chief underwriters of Extend and Pretend. Right? I mean, in the crucial negotiations of the spring of 2010, when there could have been that fierce uh, PSI involved haircut on the Greeks and then the whole, that whole fantasy. The people who are pushing back are the French, the ECB, and then the word comes down by way of the IMF, the DSK is not to do anything adventurous, and the Americans want uh, extended and pretend. Right, no, that's absolutely right. and, and I think that for them is this, this emergency mode they go into, and above all we don't want any constitutional talk. None of that German nonsense, we don't, talk, we don't want to be talking about the, the, the mess that Kate designed for us. We don't want to go there at all, we just want, we must not have another name. So I, I agree that this, this has to be treated as a sort of fragment that, that travels around rather than somebody early on was making, I think Jacqueline was making some very acute observations about the function of political language in these kind of conversations, and this is one of those fragments. So right? it's like the presidents were in line, because on yeah. the whole, doctrine in central banking yeah. would be, don't open your mouth unless exactly. you mean it. Yeah. But if you, if you find yourself saying something, Oh damn! That's what you meant. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. no. So it's just the opposite of what you're describing. It's quite a slippery thing. Preschoolers too much. Once I've said it, that's the law. I don't go back. Sorry. So, Sylvia, what? Um, just one quick point, and then a question, um, which may be better postponed till the next set of. Uh, Conversations, if we're going to have one, Mark. Are, 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 we gonna, anyway. are we going to have one? Um, this might, could be our wrap up. Okay, it's our wrap up. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, the PAL doctrine, uh, the amount of ammunition that will be needed in the next crisis it, mm. is mind boggling. So, I, you know, that may have worked for our historical juncture, but I, I can't imagine that smart people, and these are smart people, um, will invoke that again because precisely of the risk of you know, the signaling effect of even hinting at that, right? The ammunition needed is, is absolutely huge. Um, to Herman, these are just data points. Um, if you look at the amount of money um, in private equity, this is a, something that's been a bugaboo of mine for a long time, and add the leverage, there's about a trillion dollars of uninvested private equity money right now chasing profits mostly in the US and that completely accentuates I think your concentration story and we have no insight into that because there's no data collected on that um, so here's my here's my question um, and I, I agree with everything that that um, Jonathan said the private equity point goes to Jan and I think I've made the private equity point as an anonymous reviewer for your paper um, so revealing myself so I've heard a consistent story. Um, the key currency role will endure as the order shifts. I, I think I've pretty much heard that through through the day. Um, change on the key currency front is going to is going to come in a nonlinear manner. Um, the shocks could come from anywhere. So that's the story I've heard today. My question is. Um, if I put a gun to your head and said, I need to look, you need to tell me one place to look for the pace of change in underlying circumstances that is accentuating or attenuating vulnerability to those shocks. And this is kind of a question for everybody who's here. Where do I look? Is that, is that question clear? Do I look at, um, do, is U.S. growth continuing to relatively outperform? I mean, my problem with that answer is I don't think we measure GDP appropriately. And if you're going to hang your story on intangible value um, companies, then I'm not, I can't have the answer be GDP because GDP doesn't measure intangible value. So my question is, you know, what should I be tracking, because I'm a control freak, to figure out when the train is going to, you know, spin out of control and go on fire? We have well, it's not a two fingers, so I don't know. No, no, it's fine. Oh, just pull one. All right, so um, two things. First, the answer to your question quickly is clearly the, the, my takeaway from this is the Eurozone. That's where the shock is going to happen because it seems inevitable that there is going to be some political you know, decision to either have a referendum or something else that genuinely puts that under threat. And that strikes me as the one area where you can argue the, the current U.S. administration has a clear coherent worldview to screw over or to not care what what's going to happen. So that strikes me as the most obvious cause of path. 
Now that said, to contradict what I just said, I want uh, to take on John, um, and I'm really glad you were that negative because it allows me to <laughs> offer at least a, and, and by the way, I'm like 45% agreeing with you. So I'm not, I'm not entirely, Sorry, convergence. but I want to offer a 55% alternative score, which is this to say is the bad. If the world's biggest optimist is 45 <laughs> 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 perfect oh, now, man, please. Um, which is to say the following. I, I understand, you know, I remember the rant that you just gave, because you wrote it really extremely well, um, you know, failure review of books, about how once we voted for Trump, that's it. It's never going to, we're never going to go back. Let me offer a counter narrative, which is, in fact, Trump represents the toughest test of the liberal order that you're thinking about, and it actually survives the test. And there's at least a few minimal data points you can suggest to say that that's happening even now. In other words, despite the, the horrible rhetoric and promises that Trump made when he was campaigning and even during the transition, if you see what he has actually done on the sort of order questions that you're talking about, there actually hasn't been all that much. He canceled TPP, but that's not a moral blow. That's just, you know, that, that's a minor thing. He reversed on one China. You know, and indeed, he's got a Secretary of State who now seems to be in love, you know, parroting the, the China line, so that, you know, that, that uh, threat has been diffused. He reaffirmed the relationships with, you know, South Korea and Japan, and indeed, there is no difference as near as I can determine in terms of what Trump's, Trump's policy has been towards Pacific Rim than if Hillary Clinton or if Marco Rubio had been There's no difference there. Even on NATO, although he keeps talking about the idea of these people having to chip in, it's dumb rhetoric, but it doesn't actually translate into anything substantive on policy, and it's worth noting that the people who are his chief interlocutors on NATO, people like Jim Mattis, do see clearly buy into that order. So even if he's talking smack about it, others within his very administration, you know, are, are sounding more enthusiastic. Um, and even on the economic side, you have people like Gary Cohn that are clearly managing to block <coughs> the sort of most extreme economic populist actions that are taking place. If he continues to be less and less popular, it's possible that the very populists who, you know, were animating this thing wind up disappearing. The last piece, the last sort of data point I would throw out is that the area where he's been the most conventional Republican was as a nominee for the Supreme Court, which is Gorsuch. I mean, if, if another, you know, Gorsuch is conservative, and, and I don't want to get into the, the normative aspects of this, but no one looks at Gorsuch and thinks, oh my God, that's an embarrassment for the Supreme Court. That's right. so my question to you is the following. If Trump winds up either reappointing Yellen or appointing someone that is the Fed equivalent of Gorsuch to become the chairman of the Federal Reserve, would you then acknowledge that, in fact, this actually was a tough test, and it turns out that the order wasn't threatened in the way that we thought it was in December of 2016? So that, that's, that was really good and really coherent, and I even like the test. You know, if he reappoints Yellen, that's a, that's a really fair test, because put me down for golfing, buddy. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, 45% permit convinced you're correct. But I, I, mean, I, I'm not but even I sure think I that's a nice, it's a nice kind of test you can put out in advance. It's yeah. only 10 months away, right. and so we'll see that. So, uh, so I, I, I hope you're right. I hope you're right about everything you've said. I hope I'm wrong. The three, the, here are the three things, here are the three reasons why I, I remain the way I remain. Um, <laughs> Um, one is, and they all, <laughs> they all root to the fact that th this administration has not yet been tested. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be tested in three ways. And it has to not catastrophically fail those three tests. Um, the one that scares me the most, as some of you know, is a major terrorist attack within the United States. It is virtually inevitable that will happen at some point. And what the domestic political reaction by the administration will be yeah. is, is just a fundamentally major moment mm -hmm. in, in this experiment that is the Trump administration because you're talking about due process issues and you're talking about speech issues. And if the U.S. hardens on process and speech, then the way in which it presents itself internationally is going to look different and it will shape the way it's oriented in world politics. Um, secondly is, like every administration, it will be presented by an unexpected foreign policy crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and what the instincts of this administration are in its reaction to that crisis will tell us a lot about, again, the form, so, so what I'm saying is we've got the, we've, the, the, the stuff is melted and it's going to be forged. And so, and things like the terrorist attack and the foreign policy crisis and other things <laughs> will tell us how it will be forged and what the shape that it will take. And, you know, it could, they could 
not screw up on all of these three things. And the third thing is, I, I'm usually very happy to, to declare that I'm a, an old New York City boy, but in this instance, I've been around Trump since the 80s, um, and it's a, been a really unpleasant experience. Um, he has very few consistent or thought through positions, but the two that he has consistently articulated for over 30 years has been hostility to international trade and racism. Uh, and so, when, so, it's the, so it's the potential of a trade war that will be the, another thing that will be formative of the emerging U.S. foreign policy and its orientation with the rest of the world. And he can pass all three of those tests. You know, terrorist attacks, rolls off his back, foreign policy crisis handles as well, doesn't drag us into a trade war, and, and is racist and is contained then some version of the American order, and then he reappoints Yellen, and everyone <laughs> says I was a crazy alarmist, then fine, you know, crazy alarmists can have a role in life, and so, you know, <laughs> I, can be, I can be wrong, but we'd all be, we'd all be better off in those circumstances, but I am, I am very anxious. Can I, can I do a two-finger? Um, so I'm going to channel Bronco since he's not here. Um, that, you know, it's all well and good, but, you know, the vacuum between sterling hegemony and dollar hegemony was characterized by the unrelenting rise of authoritarian populism in many, many places. And so it's not, I don't think it's all about Trump. It's about structural economic um, circumstances that are, in fact, um, I think, probably related to um, the role of the U.S. economy globally. So, you know, I just, I just, I, we, we lost sight of, I think, that reality. But the, yeah, the causation there, though, I think is complex, right? I mean, so one side of it could be some kind of cycle by way of a, a real economic crisis in the real economic sector, an ongoing crisis in the Eurozone that produces the kind of disenfranchisement and dissatisfaction we see in France. But on my reading of the interval period, the more powerful effect is the one that Jonathan mentioned which is that once an actor like the US exposes itself as being as unreliable as this, every other elite group making policy everywhere else has to recalibrate its bets on the liberal order. And the single most optimistic thing I think we've seen is what's been going on in the G20, where the US just looks freakish and an outlier, and the other 19, maybe minus Putin, maybe minus the Indians, but basically a lot of other people are doubling down on their commitments, right? notably the Chinese and now the Indonesians as well, lecturing America on protectionism, because there is, there's a Polanian story which tips one way, but there's also, as it were, the majority, the other time where the winners in the globalization game see their stake and are powerfully willing to step up and defend it. And the US is very important in all the ways we've mapped, that it is not the only piece of the puzzle, and certainly as far as trading goods is concerned, you can make globalization work, if necessary, with much reduced trade with the United States. And it's not even evident that China welcomes the scale of its export surplus to the US because it's a symptom of imbalance, which they would rather rebalance in more, direct, more constructive directions. So I think there's a pushback. So to answer your question about the test, like Perry Merling and I discussed the logic of a world in which dollars are not made by central banks, and they're, not, they're made by private actors, and increasingly, of course, they're not made by American private actors, or even in London, which is largely American banks or European banks pretending to be American banks, but in other places. And the, the, I think that Perry thinks that the real test of this moment is a kind of EM on EM dollar-denominated financial crisis, and whether any of the central actors in the system feel they have an obligation to step in and help manage that. Right? So have the plumbing. Is the plumbing, and, have the plumbing exactly. and do it. Say some yeah. carry trades in East Asia, notably centered on the Japanese banks, where, where the, the, the spreads in the usual hedge trades have blown out to unprecedentedly large scales, and where one might see swap lines activated, but they haven't been activating them so far. Those are... That, at the very least, we'd say will be a novel type of crisis. Right? If there's novel types of governance, there might also be these dollar-denominated EM on EM type. I'm using that as a shorthand. Yeah, I just mean a thoroughly non-Western crisis. Yeah, the nodes aren't going to use all work. Yeah. And so then, does the management structure we have cope with that? One last point on the Eurozone and these referenda. I think a really underrated moment came at the end of 16, the awful year of 16. I mean, so we've seen central banks operating with regard to democracy in Europe in three different ways, right? We saw the brutalization of Greece in 2015, and Draghi couldn't help himself, 
exactly as Jonathan was saying, whatever he did, it was political. He clearly didn't want to be the guy who was simultaneously social worker, policeman, judge, jury, and executioner all in one. That's what he just had to do, in a sense. Then we saw Carney, who was intervening very aggressively in the Brexit debate, lost the argument, but didn't retaliate, but instead opened liquidity and underwrote the outcome of a democratic process, however disagreeable it was, which I think is a rather different way of responding to a referendum from what we saw in the Eurozone. And then I think the third, and the thing that's really underrated, is the announcement by Draghi that whatever the outcome of the Italian referendum, the bond buying for Italy was not in question. And that seems to me, if I'm in my kind of utopian mode, that's how I want central bank policy to be conducted with regard to democracy. There needs to be, like with polling, for two months before and two months afterwards, the central bank simply <coughs> underwrite the democratic process, and not just passively, but aggressively, if there are speculators <coughs> seen to be going out and conditioning bets on particular outcomes, that they use whatever tools they have at their disposal to punish that yeah, behavior. Yeah. Right? So you create a kind of zone in which the democratic process is allowed to function. Obviously, then we have a question of boundaries and where that begins and where that ends, and otherwise it would be a full subordination of the political, of monetary policy to the political process. But we've seen in the space of 18 months three different ways of conducting from a central bank policy with regard to referendum in Europe. So what, so what happens when Draghi's out the door? Uh, as long as it's, well, you know, a huge mm. thing, there's a spit. Yeah, I don't yeah, I mean, know. That's, I think that's it's Scottish nationalists might want to talk to you about it. It's very hard to <laughs> but, but, I mean, I just think that yeah. that, for me, is why I'm not so worried about the Eurozone right now, because they actually have developed quite a complex politics of how to conduct monetary policy with regard to disruptive political yeah. events. And there's, a, there's an evident left-right version to it. Syriza is one thing, the Italian referendum is another. Um, but it's, uh, so there's no, there's no neutrality. There can't be neutrality, right? Um, but it's not, it's not quite as, there are ways of sterilizing. Uh, that kind of thing. Who is in next? Or are we all exhausted? Paul Just in response to Jonathan, um, it was very interesting that three things that you picked out were all things that could go wrong. But there's something else that happens with governments as well, and I would say this is my central worry about the current administration. Um, government's really tough, it always disappoints. I mean, when, when Obama was elected, I can remember dinner parties at home and saying this will be the end of Camelot. You know, they, they have waited for this for a very long time, and now they'll discover that government um, disappoints. And I think America is going through that, and I think it will go on for a very long time, whoever had been elected this time. And it's, and it's, I think it changes the culture of politics and actually and public attitudes to, to politics. And then you have Trump. And it's not obvious at all how you'll respond to things um, going wrong. I mean, I, I assume, I mean, he's already attacked the media, will, will the voters being pushed out? I assume he will attack his own party. Um, I assume ultimately he retreats to his daughter and his, his son-in-law. I'm making a completely serious um, point, but kind of various bits that I don't know whether they exist, but that that get reported in the White House. The interesting thing will be how orderly a process, and there is always a winnowing out. I mean, people you refer to Geithner and others. If you think about the beginning of the Obama administration, there's great Paul Volcker, and Larry, and Chrissy Roma, and little Tim, and he goes through a kind of problem with his confirmation. But at the end of it, who is the most influential person in economic policy making out of those four under the Obama administration? It's Tim, partly because he was in a confirmed office and just sat there. Um, but the winning out was amazing, and it will happen under Trump as well. But who is left standing and how orderly that process is, and it seems to me that it's likely to be disorderly, and that he thrashes out and blames um, people. And it's not at all clear. In a, in a system of government which, I mean, we hate it, frankly, when we look at it, increasingly relies on executive power, ironically, given our system, and judicial power. You know, this is all set up for some horrible clash with Congress and the vice So I'm, I'm, I don't know. Well, I think that's right, but the, there's a part of it that I want to 
underscore some difference with, which is that that is, I think that analysis is exactly right, but too normal politics for my taste. Meaning that it, I, don't, I don't think it makes sense to try and look at the current, the recent American election and the phenomenon of Trump as a manifestation of something about partisan politics in the U.S. I think that originally when I was writing in horror about the Trump phenomenon, what I was writing about was saying, look, this guy's not going to win. But the fact that he got this far has exposed some profound dysfunctions in the American political system that we had not fully processed. And so I think that, the, I think that what's most, the dangers being generated by America right now reflect that underlying dysfunction that allowed this type of person to become president of the United States even more than the person himself, even though I think your analysis about what happens in administrations and mm. the kind of the, the winnowing down towards the kind of frustrated possible uh, is, I think, is right and will be right. But the, I think the problem yeah. is, is, is different and larger. Actually, that's what makes this different from the UK, because in the UK we have some of the same underlying frustrations. But through, again, through the gods of partly our system of government, the person who ends up being prime minister is a 60 year old, seasoned, right. um, a grown up. Completely different, yeah. <laughs> a completely different kind of. So, our opportunity to transition away from this, which is something that she recognizes, all her big speeches to the people are about, I get it, whether she does, and, whether, and even if she does, whether she can do anything about it is another matter. I would, I would like to second what Jonathan's saying. I, I'm trying to write this book right now about, and, and I've got this, uh, I thought it could kind of fade out at the end. And my problem is I've, I've got to kind of rethink it. And in retrospect, going back over the account of 2010 and onwards, it seems to me the two moments, the two standoffs in Congress over fiscal policy in 2011 and 2013 are really hugely significant, particularly 2013, right? I mean, and the only reason that that doesn't scream out is, that, is because the Fed was there backstopping. Um, and so all we were really talking about and that for was the taper tantrum. Um, and um, that's the central preoccupation. But in any other state at any other moment, the fact that uh, you know, 10 to 15 percent of, of Congress had, had held the entire political system, and the implication of what was that they challenged its legitimacy radically, that they did not accept the legitimacy of the president or his major legislative achievement. You know, if this was if this was Europe, if this was uh, Europe in the interwar period, this would be the beginning of the rise of the far right and an undermining of the competence of government and. And I really think with, say, Aishin Green's account, you know, the Hall of Mirrors account, that we're entering this kind of grey zone. I mean, that was finished too early in a sense, but we are now, as it were, the grey has shaded into darker and darker, uh, and that's where we're at. But I think those moments are, are absolutely pivotal, and, and that you can see a war going on beginning at that moment inside the Republican Party with the Chamber of Commerce beginning to push back hard and trying to get a grip on this, because they know... If it jumps from healthcare, which is really a religious issue, you know, if it jumps the functionally significant policy areas, they're in trouble, and it jumps the trade, right? And it jumps by way of this, you know, cretinous guy who's got this idea rolling around from the 1980s, but it explodes into a real social conjuncture, um, which is then misinterpreted by way of his 1980s mechanicalism. And, and I think that is the, that's what I meant about the swap lines, right? If this process, as it were, can jump another, it can break another fire break and move from there to monetary policy and to global, the globally significant functional things, that's, I think, what we're, we're really uh, dealing with. So I'm determined to furnish at 5.30 because that's a perfectly decent time to start drinking. Um, however, my little two cents on this one goes like this before we go anywhere. I just want everybody in the room to sort of call on this one. But it's a nice way to end. So who does this matter for? Let's imagine Jonathan's right. The train has jumped the tracks, right? We're in that, oh, shit moment, or like the coyote over, whatever your analogy is, right? It's all about to go to hell, right? We don't quite know how bad this smash is going to be. We're watching it in real time. Does it matter more for the rest of the world still? Or does it matter now for us just as much, if not more? Because the old story, to take the Connolly line, right, you know, our currency, your problem, right? Is it still the case that we can asymmetrically exercise our damage onto the rest of the world? Or is it the case that you've got 18 of the G20 going, they're crazy, we're just going to do our own shit. And actually, it will come back and hurt us more. <coughs> so, you know, how does it play out? 
are we are we still invulnerable to it? I used to describe the United States as the unscrew upable country because it, it didn't matter what we did, we, we still got the benefits, right? So you know that was it. Is that still the case? Right? What do you think? It has never been the case. It looks like it. So here's my closing question. If it's all going to go to hell in a handbasket, should I, should I be still at Brown or should I take a job in the UK or should I go to New Zealand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. New Zealand. There's some very interesting oh, IMF research um, that, that Sylvia and I cited that talked about adjustment and, and the US, which is essentially what we're that. talking about. And, and their conclusion was that if, if adjustment happens smoothly, then the U.S. is overwhelmingly a winner in deflation, right. and the external balance sheets um, help that. But if it happens as in, in severe market dislocation, which is hard to, you don't have to agree with Jonathan to think that that's likely, then the U.S. is, is a huge lo relative loser. So, so, so you can, can, can be done by Sorry? the private But you still may well. well. Yeah. yeah. You don't yeah. have to, but you can. Yes, you don't need to, but you're perfectly at liberty to, to agree. <laughs> so, so the answer to your question is, is uh, to my mind, is given What's been said here is go to Cambridge. Because <laughs> the, 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 the country that has the power to deflect more than any other through currency depreciation is the UK. Yeah. Yeah. Can I speak to just the broader question about the, this, this used to think of as the unscrewable country? I mean, I think what has been so striking to me in watching the early months of the Trump administration is that. Um, at least in terms of the rhetoric, you know, maybe sort of the account is that actually they haven't done as much as you, you know, thought they might be doing given yeah. the rhetoric. But to see these international institutions that I take to be a direct result of American power and kind of created in the image of the of American interests, things like NATO, the WTO, yeah. the entire international liberal order. To see those directly attacked by somebody at the pinnacle of the American government and his, you know, the people around him, is so shocking to me. It makes me think, in fact, you know, this is like a what is it, a self goal, a self oh, wound, no. own goal, self inflicted wound. That, Stay that here. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's been a long day. It's been a little addled. But I mean, that is so fundamentally shocking, right? Because um, it goes against everything. You know, us as IR scholars think that we know about national interests and grand strategy and how this stuff works. Um, and it also just is so shocking for somebody who's grown up in the post-war era, right? Um, so unfortunately, I definitely think that, you know, this is a break. This is a true break. And hopefully, you know, the rhetoric will settle down and, and the grown-ups will prevail. Although, you know, you, we keep getting examples of how the grown-ups are not even in the room for really important stuff, right? Um, so I do think the sort of underlying structural things at work here are not going to go away, even if Trump is, is voted out, out of office in three years or whatever. So sadly, we are screw up -able. Mm -hmm. He's going to get the last Shall one. Now, uh, I just wanted to add, perhaps it's a good thing that's happened, because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah, yeah. because for all, no, I, I don't mean in that sense, because for all these years, the rest of the world has been getting lectures from the US, right? Especially the de developing world and the emerging markets, so to speak, on economics, right. on democracy. 
I mean, the extreme of that was when Hezbollah came to power, they said, that's not true democracy, right? right. That's not true elections. So in many ways, 2008 was the moment where, you know, the world said, that's it. You know, you lecture us, see what you've done to yourself. And Trump's election is kind of an adjustment process with the entire morality of politics and economics has gone away. And the entire world has moved towards the right. So to answer your question, uh, I don't think there's anywhere to go because, you know, you can come to oh. Canada, but we have to yeah, You can go to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I should off this by saying it's a good thing, so I'm still waiting for the... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's a good thing because... Yeah. Exposing American hypocrisy. Yes, right. a little come up in, you know. In, in that sense, it's a, it's a good thing from the, from, from the point of view of the rest of the world. No, 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 absolutely. That's right. Well, that's why it is so shocking. It's a good moment for shock. That, that Trump is attacking <laughs> these institutions that are entirely in our interest. Look, okay, Kate, you, ha you have to remember that you're a hopelessly out of touch coastal elite who's benefited at the expense oh, yeah. of the Midwest and everybody who lived there. Absolutely. So basically, right. we don't care what you say. <laughs> and I'm going off to meet Mr. Bannon for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. <coughs> All right, it's 5.30. I want to thank everybody for staying the course. It's been a fabulous conversation. Uh, there was no agenda beyond just bringing you in the room. I hope that this has been stimulatory for everyone. It certainly has for me. <coughs> Uh, we've had Katie here from uh, Foreign Affairs basically picking over the corpus of what we've got and the idea is that we may have a conversation afterwards and see what's of interest in the magazine, etc. We have got papers of shape or form and that could work as the basis for that. And if and when that comes off, I will of course be in touch. What's happening now is that I will find out where that little bus is to take you back to the hotel. And then there will be another little bus, I believe it's 7 o'clock, I'm trying to get a hold of Ellen to confirm this, at the hotel to take you where we're going for dinner. Uh, and that's that, and it's like all really easy, and then we can do that. So there we go. So thank you all very much for being here. Thank you.